Good afternoon. My name is Cecilia Rouse, and I'm the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this um, wonderful talk that we have today with President Barroso. It's my job to first introduce the person who will be introducing President Barroso. So I would like to introduce my colleague, Wolfgang Danspacken Gruber, who is the founding director of the Lichtenstein Institute on Self-Determination, or LISD. And he's been teaching here on issues of state security, self-determination, diplomacy, and crisis diplomacy here at the Woodrow Wilson School and the Department of Politics since 1988. We don't actually do the subtraction, so, but you can do the math. He's also the founder and chair of the Lichtenstein Colloquium on European and International Affairs, a private uh, diplomacy forum in, uh, forum in Lichtenstein. LISD seeks to create a global objective and non-polemical environment for the discussion, research, and publication of issues related to and emerging from self-determination. And it's really thanks to Wolfgang that we have this great speaker today. So Wolfgang, thank you. Sit down. Take your seat. Well, thank you very much for this unexpected <laughs> introduction. Uh, welcome to the uh, Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Magnificence, Mr. President, Cher José, it is with great pleasure that I can finally welcome you here not just in the name of the Liechtenstein Institute and the Woodrow Wilson School, but also my co-sponsors, European, the European Union Program and the Program on Contemporary European Politics and Society at Princeton University. This is, as you know, and as you have been here already, uh, an August university, and it is an eminent school, which has seen come, stay, and go be educated and inspired, many a distinguished political actor, and frequently I have been involved in their visits. But I have to say that in all these decades I've been here, I have rarely been able to introduce to our students and my colleagues a person whose focus and work in politics academia, and Europe has run so prominently through their entire life, as in your case, Jose. You are, for me and for us, exemplary of character in your studies, undertaking, and contributions, and devotions to public and European affairs. And hence, we are delighted to welcome you on the Rudolf Wilson School of International Affairs. President, Barroso graduated, President Barroso's graduate education began in law at the University of Lisbon, from where he then went to Geneva to study for a diploma in European Studies at the European University Institute, and there he did so with Denis de Rougemont and Dusan Zijansky, our both uh, advisor, who unfortunately can't be here with us today. At the Université de Genève, he earned his master's degree in political science from the Department of Political Science in the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences. And he did so in both cases with honors. From there, he actually embarked on an academic career where he was working successfully and successively as a teaching assistant at the law faculty of the University of Lisbon and the Department of Political Science in Geneva. And he became then a visiting researcher and visiting professor at the Department of Government and the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. In 1995, he became head of the International Relations Department of the Lusiada University in Lisbon. Importantly, for my young colleagues here, I would like to emphasize that in 1979, José Durao Barroso founded the University Association for European Studies, an excellent example of research, academia, and actual initiative. Parallel to this academic career, which was set on track, President Barroso's political career began in 1980, when he joined Portugal's Social Democratic Party, the PSD, and he was named president of that party in 1999, and since then has been re-elected three times. 
And during the same period, President Barroso also served as Vice President of the European People's Party. As a State Secretary for Foreign Affairs and Cooperation, José Manuel Barroso played a key role as a mediator in the signing of the peace accords for Angola in 1991. And as Minister for Foreign Affairs, which he became then on, he was a driving force for the self-determination process and the eventual uh, development towards uh, sovereignty for East Timor. And under the leadership of uh, José Manuel Barroso, the PSD won the general elections in 2002, and he was appointed Prime Minister of Portugal in that year. President Barroso, in this case still not yet, uh, was Prime Minister till July 2004, and I remember when we were together in uh, Lisbon for the Dialogue of Cultures, uh, which was in April 2004, and I remember, and you should also, that this was the first year after the beginning of the Iraq War, and the third year where ISAF was in Afghanistan, so the world was full of international uh, uh, tensions and conduct of hot crisis. Summer 2006, uh, then already President Barroso, President of the European Commission, uh, inaugurated the Sound of Europe in Salzburg at the 250th anniversary of uh, Mozart. And uh, he um, uh, was then, I remember in his speech, sort of showed this whole notion of um, Europe being uh, at the center of culture and interaction and the notion of values also related to the transatlantic relationship. In June 2009, the European Council anonymously nominated him for a second term of President of the European Commission. Let me now quickly mention some of the just selected biggest challenges and for me very large achievements in his, as we call it here, tenure of President of the European Commission. First and foremost, of course, your involvement in the Treaty of Lisbon, and which is today the base of so much of the European Union. Secondly, however, you were constantly challenged and demanded in the question of enlargement of the European Union and there, in one case, also very sensible, the issue of Turkey and the European Union. Then you had something which I found very important, which you really pushed consistently, and that is the notion of research within the European Union. And uh, I was reminded um, by a common friend that uh, you launched this whole notion with Shors Sharpak uh, and uh, Sijansky in the framework of La Main à la Pâte. And then eventually it developed into the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, as I dare say for me. This is uh, anybody who knows the Charles River, it sounds very familiar. Um, and uh, besides this, uh, your focus on education and of the youth and uh, the uh, challenges of unemployment by the young has been like a leitmotif uh, through your tenure. However, you had to deal with major crises. First and foremost, the war, Russia, Georgia, 2008 where you negotiated uh, uh, with uh, President Putin, but also had Nicolas Sarkozy, who then was head of the European Council, with you. Secondly, you, um, I found, uh, did something to complete European enlargement by um, bringing in other states in Southeastern Europe, um, and hence uh, completing uh, the continental dimension. And finally, last but not least, the notion of energy and climate change. The whole EU climate change package, something which is for us today uh, totally uh, um, en courant, but in effect it was really under your tenure that it was um, uh, in, in, uh, developed and implemented. And in your most recent State of the Union address, you began to venture this idea of a federation of nation states. And with all this, I would like to say that it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you 
to a place which prides itself in the nation service and in the service of all nations, and in your case, in Europe's service. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome President Jose Manuel Durano. <clears throat> Dean Rose, dear Wolfgang, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, first let me thank Dean Cecilia Rose and Professor Wolfgang Dunspeak Gruber for their warm welcome. Particular thanks to you, Wolfgang. Your words were so kind. I take it as another manifestation of our friendship. I'm really uh, delighted to be at Princeton in such an extraordinary university and in a country where the ties of kinship with Europe are as old as they are strong. Being here brings me back memories of my academic years in the United States and also my student days in Geneva, where I first met Wolfgang and where, in fact, I was studying European politics and European affairs. Having lived under a dictatorship in my native Portugal, I was 18 years age, of age when there was a democratic revolution in Portugal, I experienced the hope that the European aspiration offered my country and how it helped to anchor democracy. This is important to understand when you speak about Europe and the European Union. My generation, like the same generation in Spain or in Greece, or another generation in Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, was looking to Europe as the promise of democracy. And this is important to understand, the linkage between European Union and democracy. And in those days, when I was 18 years of age, or even a little bit later, Bookshelves of European and American bookstores used to be filled with volumes dedicated to the merits of European integration. They have started now to be filled with volumes arguing that Europe is in decline, eclipsed by the emerging economies to whom, it is argued, belongs the future. The reality is, to paraphrase Mark Twain, the reports on the so-called death of European integration are greatly exaggerated. I recognize that for our friends abroad, it may not always be easy to understand Europe, its decision-making process, and to anticipate the capacity of Europeans to take very important decisions. But the good news is that in the midst of the deepest crisis in its short history, the European Union is still alive and better than many seem to think. European leaders, with the support of European citizens and European institutions, keep on taking important decisions proving wrong the professional Cassandras. And contrary to what some people try to suggest, it is not an assumption based on a, what I call a TINA argument. TINA means there is no alternative. It is simply not true to say that there is no alternative. Of course, in life there are always alternatives. The question is that they are worse alternatives. The Dutch voters, which were recently to the pools, were offered other alternatives, but they have not been convinced by them. Their answer was that a political experiment involving extreme parties could not help the country get out of the current crisis. Indeed, the reality is that European integration remains the best alternative. It is not the only alternative. It is, I repeat, the best, and we need more Europe today. First, no one in Europe and beyond would like to see a revival of Europe's old divisions. Your country, United States of America, has paid a big price in helping Europe to overcome such divisions. And who could seriously think that in a world of continental-sized players, any European country will be able on its own to steer the course of events and be able to preserve its lifestyle? The European Union emerged in a continent physically and morally devastated by two world wars that some of us in Europe call two European civil wars, and the barbarity of the concentration camps and the absolute evil of the Shoah. In reaction to these traumatic events, peace and promotion of democracy, human dignity, shared prosperity, tolerance and justice lie at the heart of the process of European integration. These values are enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty, as they are enshrined in the Bill of Rights. And it is thanks to European integration, an unprecedented transformation project, that Europeans have been able to consolidate them over the last 60 years. 
And why? The answer is consent and rule of law. The member states have freely agreed to share a community based on law. No country has been forced to join or stay against the collective will of its citizens. And the very notion of European integration rests on the concept of the subordination of power to the law. Power must be organized in such a way that it can safeguard law. It is a union built on the principles of equality between member states, the rule of law, solidarity, cohesion, and cooperation. A union also underpinned by a culture of compromise. It attests to the quest for a cosmopolitan law in which compliance with the norms serves what can be considered universal values. And it is in many ways a laboratory for globalization, both in the sense of subordinating power politics to the rule of law, as well as by being a testing ground for successful cross-border supranational cooperation. It is a unique political process, combining economic integration with truly supranational institutions. And the success of this process is to be measured in terms of peace, stability, and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality is that we have enjoyed peace and stability for over 60 years, and we are not only one of the most prosperous regions in the world, but with some of the highest levels of social justice. Even in these difficult times, the European Union remains the world's largest single market by value, with over half a billion people, 23 million small and medium-sized enterprises, and we are fully committed to releasing its full potential to deliver growth and jobs. European societies remain among the most decent societies in human history, with high levels of social cohesion, with respect for human rights, for human dignity, for rights of women, for an attachment to the preservation of our planet and high standards of environment protection. And we are also fully committed to preserve our European social model and to ensure fairness and equity as we are implementing long overdue structural reforms which require, it's true, a major, sometimes painful, or even very painful adjustment effort. In fact, we should not forget when we have this discussion about the model that it is precisely those European countries with the most effective social protection systems and with the most developed social partnerships that are among the most successful and competitive economies in the world, in fact, ranking in the first places in the world economy. The European institutions remain the best guarantors that the principles and rules agreed by all in a union of sovereign states will be upheld. And the European Commission, independent of any political party or national interest, is fully committed to exercise its obligations as guardian of the treaties and committed to the general European interest. That said, European integration is a dynamic process. It has always made progress step by step, but as I've been saying sometimes, the size of the steps has always been different. The Rome Treaty was a huge step. It was the founding moment of the European community. The Maastricht Treaty was another one. In the, many, in the meantime, there were other important but smaller steps. Now we are again in one of those moments when we need a very big leap forward. The crisis has pushed the European Union to move forward more quickly with reforms that are anyway inevitable because we will not have sustainable growth as long as we have unsustainable debt. But the economic measures we are implementing as a matter of urgency, combining fiscal consolidation with growth-boosting measures, structural reforms and targeted investment, notably on education, research, innovation, are not sufficient. We need to correct the flaws in the euro architecture and move towards a genuine economic and monetary union composed of a banking, fiscal and political union. We need an ambitious vision and an intelligence sequencing and timing to turn it into a reality. The Commission has already made a crucial first step towards the banking union with its legislative proposals for a single European supervisory mechanism for the euro area. As for the political horizon, I have recently called in my State of the Union speech in the European Parliament for a democratic federation of nation states as the best way to reconcile our member states' national autonomy and identities with an effective capacity to act and shape the course of events. Obviously, the support of European citizens is key. We need to have a serious open debate among the citizens of Europe on the way forward. As Abraham Lincoln said, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. 
But you can be sure that there is now a strong political will in Europe to do whatever it takes to exit this crisis stronger and more united than ever before. All this means that beyond what I sometimes call the intellectual glamour of pessimism related to discourse on the marginalization and even decline of Europe, such concrete facts clearly show that the European Union is far from being marginalized. It is still very much in demand by its own citizens and, I want to underline this, by the rest of the world. And it is important not just for us, but also for the rest of the world that we succeed. The European Union remains more than ever an indispensable partner for the world economy, its stability and prosperity. The world needs a Europe who stands by open economies and fights protectionism. Just look at our two economies, the European and American one. The European Union and the United States are still, by far, the most integrated economies in the world and we remain at the heart of the world economy. The transatlantic relationship accounts for half of global economic output and nearly one trillion dollars in goods and services trade and supports millions of jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. Total U.S. investments in the European Union is three times higher than in all of Asia, while European investment in the United States is eight times higher than our investment in India and China together. Did you know that the United States firms are investing more in Belgium than in China or India? And Belgium is a country with 10 million inhabitants. That the United States investments into Brazil, China and India taken together are less than half of United States flows to the Netherlands alone. Still, there is more to be done to deepen and broaden our ties. The United States and Europe are now working on a bold initiative to expand trade and investment that could make a significant contribution to our strategy to strengthen growth and create jobs. This means that global interdependence is a reality which cannot be disputed. We need to work collectively to address the deep-seated imbalances that have been building on the global stage for the last decade and which also have largely contributed to the current crisis. The world economy cannot continue like in previous years, with some countries amassing huge quantities of foreign reserves based on trade surplus, while others keep fueling overconsumption and peeling up private and public debt. Restoring growth in Europe is as, as important for the world as the U.S. actions to prevent a fiscal cliff or the rebalancing of the growth model of some emerging economies. We are all in this together, and only together we'll be able to overcome the crisis, which is indeed a global one. Ladies and gentlemen, in this fast-changing and highly unpredictable global environment, the European Union is also an indispensable partner to shape this world into a fairer, safer, rule-based and human rights abiding place. Let's be clear, Americans are not from Mars and we Europeans are not from Venus. <laughs> we are all from the same planet. And since we are speaking about the planet, the reality is that we share the same planet and a common responsibility to address together challenges that are global by nature, from the fight against climate change and our work for energy security to the fight against poverty and hunger from Africa and Afghanistan to the Middle East and South America. The European Union is very much involved in all these fronts. The world needs a European Union that seeks cooperative solutions for the problems facing the global commons, as we are doing, for instance, with climate change. The world needs a European Union which, despite the economic downturn, remains by far the biggest aid provider with 54% of the world's official development aid. The world needs a European Union that places the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals to reduce poverty by 2015 at its top and overriding priority. The world needs a European Union that in a relatively short period of time has demonstrated its capacity to promote stability and security on three continents, Europe, Africa and Asia, building on a wide range of crisis management instruments from military assets, police and diplomacy to aid and trade. The world is a European Union that is ready to complement the effectiveness of its foreign policy with a credible defense capability because there is no normative power without both soft and hard power. And among European Union's partners, the United States has obviously a place of choice. And I believe that Americans also see the European Union as this indispensable partner. In fact, when I looked last week at the freshly released German Marshall Fund Transatlantic Trans Survey, I noted an American's renewed focus on Europe. 
In particular, I noticed that two in three Americans, in fact, 63 percent, to be more precise, consider that it is desirable for the European Union to exercise a strong leadership in world politics. And I also noticed that more than half of the Americans, 55 percent, believe that for their country, Europe is more important than Asia. Still, according to these findings, two-thirds of Americans say that the United States and the European Union share enough values and have enough common interests to enable a strong bilateral cooperation. Indeed, the United States, a united Europe, is really an indispensable partnership. Because the hard reality is that even if the challenges are common, not all countries make the same analysis or react the same way. The appalling situation in Syria is there to remind us all of the harsh consequences of this agreement amongst the members of the UN Security Council. The situation in the country is intolerable. A new and democratic Syria, which truly represents all the country's communities, must emerge. We have a joint responsibility to make this happen and to press those whose cooperation is essential to achieve this goal. Iran's nuclear ambitions and the tense situation in the wider Middle East remind us also that peace is not a foregone conclusion. Autocratic regimes on the European Union's very doorsteps, Belarus being a case in point, confirm that history does not work in a linear fashion towards democracy for all. We have to support those who are fighting for democracy and human dignity and remain vigilant that fragile transitions do not end up being hijacked by non-democratic forces. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, more than ever, European citizens need an active and influential Europe in the world, and I believe an active and influential Europe is needed by the rest of the world. This is a message I've been hearing from all our strategic partners, from the United States to China, from India to Brazil. This is a message I'm particularly pleased to echo here, being the host of a school named after a man, Woodrow Wilson, whose vision for world peace and commitment to progress remain a source of inspiration for all of us. A man once said, tell me what is right and I will fight for it. A European Union that stands by its founding values and that embodies open regionalism, open democracies, open societies, open economies, remains indeed more than ever an indispensable partner to fight together for our ideas, for what we believe is right. I thank you for your attention. President Barroso has kindly agreed, first of all, congratulations for a great speech, uh, has kindly agreed to take questions. And in the interest of time, I would like to ask you to present short and brief questions. I invite you to come to the microphone. And the floor is yours. Yes, please. No, uh, if I can do it for Thank you. Um, I could give a whole conference on climate change. It's one of my, the cause of fighting climate change is one of my passions, and I'm extremely proud of the work the European Commission, the European Union has been doing in this matter. Now, what I believe about it very succinctly, I think we have a problem now. The reality is that because of the financial crisis, the climate change issue is not getting the attention it deserves. We can say that today 97% of scientists agree, agree that the current problems we are watching in terms of major uh, weather uh, changes and in some cases natural disasters have to do with man-made climate change. 97% of scholars saying this, as you know, in science it's really impressive. It's very hard to find a field of science where we have 97% of science. By the way, in economy, I think it's, it's not possible when you look at the discussions about the, the economy. So this is an important point. The world is going through dramatic changes, and we have to do something to put an end to this. I believe that the conclusions of Durban were good. 
So the commitment taken by major emitters to accept binding um, rules for 2020, and we are working to make that a reality. The European Union, in our own territory, we have agreed, following a proposal by the European Commission, it was unanimously agreed by the Member States to have some limits. They are already enshrined in legislation, and we are basically on track to achieve the goals of 20% reduction compared to 1990 in terms of emissions, in terms of uh, uh, renewables in the energy mix, and uh, in terms of the general policy on climate change. But I want to be very frank and open with you. It's not an easy task today. Because precisely because of the pressure of the financial and economic crisis, there is a tendency to relax. There is a tendency in the public opinion and sometimes at leaders level to say, look, this is not our priority. And it's true that uh, the financial crisis appears sometimes more urgent. But the fact that it's more urgent does not mean that it's more important. We have really a problem, existential problem regarding our planet. Some of the countries that exist today may disappear in the not so distant future because of rising uh, sea levels. That is why I believe it is important that the United States, that is, uh, as a country, the biggest economy in the world, as a single country, uh, also participates in this effort, together with uh, China, who is, of course, also another major emitter, and that we have a binding, a global binding system to reduce the emissions, of course, with a trajectory that is feasible. For that, I count on public opinion and science to mobilize the opinion, the opinion in the world, to mobilize, to, to have the necessary support for some difficult decisions that uh, countries have to make. And I believe the issue is going to uh, achieve a new degree of um, awareness and a new uh, focus precisely because of these dates that we have now decided in Durban, where the decision was good. So there is also a very important progress in terms of science, including, by the way, the United States. China is investing a lot in some areas as well, but we believe it's not, it's not enough. It's not enough to just rely on a scientific solutions for the future, because to have some common regulate, regulatory norms at global level, it will be a way of creating the necessary incentives for more decisions in that field. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, thank you, first of all. Um, you spoke about Europe having a unique and sophisticated social cohesion, um, but do you believe that the recent successes of far-right nationalist movements in countries like France and Greece threaten that in any sense? Yes. I believe their problem exists, and this is precisely because that problem exists that I think it is up to us um, in European institutions, but also the leaders at national level, to make the case for Europe, for some of them to leave the comfort zone, to take Europe for granted. I've said in this speech that Wolfgang mentioned before, in my speech in the European Parliament, that Europe cannot, be, cannot go on being seen as uh, bureaucratic, technocratic, or even diplomatic. It has to be seen as democratic. And the best way to do that is to engage in a serious conversation about Europe and to mobilize the mainstream forces, speaking in European terms, from the center right to the center left. The reality is that all our governments in Europe, uh, namely in the Eurozone, they are very committed to Europe. So the so-called anti-Europeans or the nationalistic forces, they have not the support they, they, they believe or they would like to have. They are more vocal, yes, and so they get sometimes more attention. But as we have seen recently in the elections in the Netherlands, and I could m make other examples, there is a huge majority in the political system that supports European integration. And it's precisely because some of those old devils in Europe of nationalism, extreme nationalism, um, that are still alive, they are worth sleeping, but they are still alive, that we have to make the case for transnational uh, integration. That a stronger Europe that also has a political dimension, because when you look at the current difficulties with the currency, at the end, the credibility of a currency or its sustainability is dependent on the solidity of the political institutions and the political construct that is behind it. So when I'm asking, or I'm suggesting, let's have a federation of the European states, it is not a super state, it is a democratic federation that needs to have the citizens involved. Now, I believe that there are very good rational arguments to go for this stronger, more integrated Europe. But for this, we need the European leaders, not only the European Commission or the European Central Bank or so-called European Parliament in Brussels, Frankfurt or Strasbourg, 
We need the national leaders to, to make the case for Europe. And I believe that we are going to win, win that debate. And in fact, I'm pleading for what we can call, uh, uh, using our term that was uh, known some years ago, also in academia, a European public space. European public space. Because the reality is that today in Europe we have, sometimes I say, 28 public spaces, the 27 member states plus the European community, so the Brussels institution space. And we need to create this. And this is the appeal I make to, to Europe today and to the European leaders and to the society in general, not only the leaders, to the civil society, to universities, by the way, universities, to, uh, to uh, scholars, but also to students, to um, um, artists, intellectuals, to um, trade unions, to business leaders, to engage in that debate. And let me just give an example. Now in the D Dutch elections, it was interesting because the business community came out saying, what we are going to lose if there is a major problem with the euro? The other day I was with the Chancellor of, of Austria uh, in a conference in Austria, and he was explaining to the public there what it will cost us in Austria if there is a disintegration of the euro. And he was quoting an independent study from an independent uh, economic uh, uh, institution. So, and this is new, because the reality was that until now, or until recently, the European project was taken for granted. Okay, European integration, it's go on. It was more, more or less automatic for those of you that are familiar with the, the theories or doctrines of integration. It was so-called spillover effect. More integration demands more integration. It's not like that. To some extent, yes. But there is a moment where it, automaticity does not apply, when we need a political will. At the end, it's a political decision. You see, this is why I believe that problem exists, what you said, rising nationalism, sometimes rising populism, but precisely the answer to this is um, leadership, is political debate, is democracy, more democracy for a stronger Europe. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you, President Barroso. Uh, you mentioned more integration and you also mentioned about harder power of military and so forth. Do you foresee in the near future a combined European army, for instance? Not in the near future and not necessarily an integrated army. But I believe that the current economic situation or financial difficulties, probably for some paradoxically, is making the case for a stronger integration defense. It's a doctrine that some of you probably know of pooling and sharing. By the way, not only in the European Union, also in NATO. I was recently here in the, in the United States, in Chicago, in the last summit of NATO, and this is discussed now. If you look at the expenditure in, in, in Europe, you see a lot of expenditure, but not always, to be frank, the most efficient. We could do much more in terms of defense if there was more pooling and sharing of defense capabilities uh, in Europe. Now, I was I'm making the case for that. I believe it's important and necessary to go that way, but I'm not going to suggest that it's the easiest way. There are, as you know, foreign policy and defense are typically those matters more associated to the, I, I like to call it old notion of sovereignty, where typically governments are more reluctant in terms of sharing power. But I think we are going on that way. And I believe it is important. And I think and there's an important evolution today is precisely the relation with the United States. To be frank, there was a time uh, some years ago where uh, the idea of having a strong European identity in defense could be seen from this side of the Atlantic as a kind of a weakening of NATO. I think this is no longer the case. The Americans now are asking themselves, and that's very important, the Europeans to do more in terms of their own organization in terms of defense. So I think it's important that Europe, at the same time that we go on with what I call a specialization of Europe, so-called soft power, to use a concept that is, I'm sure, very familiar to you, that apart from the soft power, you also have the means to intervene in some cases. And we are doing it step by step. There is Operation Atalanta in the Indic Ocean, where, in fact, it is a coordination of the European Union of actions against piracy. There has been some cases. There were some cases, for instance, in Libya, where the decision was taken by some European countries, but with the consent of the old European Union, and in fact it was the European Union countries, with, let's put it frankly, strong backing of the United States, that 
uh, have helped to change uh, some of the situation uh, in Libya that was completely intolerable. So I think there is space for Europe to do more in terms of defense, but once again, it will be step by step. But I think it gives Europe more credibility, and I believe it's in the interest of all those who share the values of democracy. Thank you very much. Now, this is excellent, and I'm particularly pleased that there are ladies now who ask the questions also. <laughs> Can I ask you, A, to have them brief, and would you mind if I put one and one together and then offer it uh, to President Barroso? Please, okay, Madam, sure. begin. Yeah. Uh, thank you, President Barroso, for your speech. No, uh, yeah, talking fast. <laughs> uh, the EU today and all its institutions are a lot about regulation. What do you think in the future? Is the European Union going to be moving more towards regulation or more towards deregulation? Thank you. Great. Thank you, well, thank you very much for your remarks as well. Um, you mentioned early on in your talk about the relationship between democracy and European integration. And I wonder if you could speak a bit to the problem of low voter turnout in elections for the European Parliament and whether you think that's a serious problem. If so, uh, what are some of the ways that the European Union might broaden voter engagement with European Union issues? Right. You want to answer that too? So first of all, uh, regulation. Um, we have to explain why, where is the person who put me the question? <laughs> yeah. um, you have to uh, understand that sometimes the critics of European regulation, I'm, they are exaggerating. Why? They don't understand that in Europe, very often we have one norm, one regulation to replace 27 national regulations. We have a single market. And these were 27 different economies. And so that's why to have a deep in the single market, sometimes common regulation is necessary. Having said this, I'm a, in favor, in fact, it was part of my program when I became commission president of the so-called better regulation. It means that based on the principles of subsidiarity, we should give back to the member states what member states can do better at the European level. So there are some cases where I don't like to use very much the word deregulation because at least in European discourse it can be misunderstood. It is immediately considered uh, um, ideological, uh, let's say, uh, prejudice. And uh, I want to avoid this, this debate. Uh, I want to be I said it, by the way, in my recent speech. There are cases where we need more powers at European level. For instance, this banking union. For instance, we have a common supervisor in the euro area. But we, do, we did not to regulate, of course, the quality of the pastries that are sold in the seaside. Some of the, these competence can go, go back. But let's be honest. When we have 27 countries, we need some level of common regulation. The question is, as always, a question of balance. The issue of democracy. Um, the European elections, unfortunately, it's not only the European Parliament. In the, in the national elections, as you know, we have seen declining trends in terms of participation, by the way, not only in Europe. Um, but it's true that European Parliament elections, they have usually less um, participation. And why? One of the reasons is that the European Parliament elections, differently from national elections, usually don't decide on the executive. When you go and vote in France or Germany or United States, you know that depending on the election, the president or the prime minister or the chancellor will be this or that. The European Parliament, no. That is why, in fact, I've made now a proposal that in the next European elections, 2014, even before it, uh, uh, any change in the treaties, there will be a kind of agreement, a gentleman agreement between the most important political forces saying the next president of the European Commission will be the one that is indicated by the political force that gains, that wins the election. The last time, in fact, my party put my name forward, but the others have not put other names. I would prefer to have someone to, to compete with. And at the end, my party won at the European level, and uh, of course, it was confirmed. But it was not accepted as such from the beginning. So, we are trying, I come back to my point, build progressively a European public space with some kind of European political parties. But this, as some of you that know more European studies, um, it's rather difficult because the public space remains very fragmented. And until now, the reality is that most of the European elections are not really about Europe, but are about national situations. So we have the problem of having um, European discussion but in fact dominated by national themes. This is why we are looking at ways of increasing the transparency, the readability 
and also to bridge the gap between citizens and European construct. And I believe we can do a lot if there is a, will, a willingness from the member states, even before uh, further revisions of the treaty uh, take place, because this is one of the issues. As I said, we have the current globalization requires in Europe more unity, if Europe wants to count. More unity demands more integration. More integration demands more democracy. Because many of the decisions taken today in Europe are in fact taken by the member states, yes, but in European institutions, at European institution level, proposed by the Commission, the Commission makes a proposal, but afterwards it is the Council, where the member states are represented, and the Parliament that vote. Or the European Central Bank was an increasingly relevant role. So that's why we need, in fact, these more mechanisms of proper accountability, transparency and democracy, and we are working on that, but of course it will be, once again, a step-by-step -step approach. So we have clearly now a time problem, um, and um, I would like to, if you don't mind, ask this lady uh, to ask the last question, and then, uh, I'm sorry. Can I just say one thing before Please. she asks her question? Yeah. Um, starting now, we're going to ask everybody to stay in their seats until after President Barroso has left the room, so after after you ask your question and he responds, I'm going to ask you to speak. That's right, yeah. Please. Thank you once again for coming to our campus. My question is, uh, why do you think the level of uh, entrepreneurship in Europe is still so low compared to the United States? And do you think it's, that's detrimental to the European economy and what are possible effective ways to increase the interest in entrepreneurship in Europe? Thank you. Yes, it is true that the, the entrepreneurship culture in Europe is not so developed as in the United States for many reasons, some of them cultural reasons. Uh, the way the state is organized, the way the economy is organized. Having said this, there are also excellent examples of entrepreneurship and success at European level. But there are some problems that we have identified uh, also that are have to do with institutions. For instance, the issue of the, um, let's say, venture capital the role of venture capital in Europe and the United States. Of course, the very fragmentation of the market, that's one of the issues that we are overcoming precisely with European integration to the single market because typically here, if you have a good idea here in the United States and if you want to immediately think at least, at least you think in the United States as your first, let's say, um, market. In Europe, typically some years ago, no, you could speak about Spain, Portugal or France or Germany, but not because there were a lot of barriers. Now, in terms of market for goods, there are no longer barriers. It's a completely integrated market, but still in digital, there are some barriers. There are still some barriers in energy and in services. This is why the European dimension is so important. I'm not saying that just because, as you have understood, a very committed European. It's not by idealism. We need that European dimension because it's a way to promote also the space for the young entrepreneurs to come in the market. This is an important issue, the, the way we look at our first home market, even if today, thanks to the internet and other uh, developments, uh, our first market should be the world. That's why, at least I think that's the way you are thinking. And that's why I tell my young people in Europe to think, our home is the world, not just uh, one country or a group of countries. But entrepreneurship, we, are, we have having programs. We have programs for young entrepreneurs. We have programs of education. We are trying to put these issues more in the, in the um, curricula and in the attitudes. Some of these um, matters, of course, take time once again because they are cultural issues. But I believe today also because of globalization, the opportunities are more and more for creative uh, spirit innovation and in fact we have a very strong agenda in Europe for innovation. We are funding many important projects for young entrepreneurs and I believe that we have touched a very important point is the culture of entrepreneurship and you can do it and as always I have a great trust in the new uh, generations. The new generations in Europe they are extraordinarily able to adapt and to and they have also this critical critical capacity. That's one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm confident about Europe, you know, I travel a lot in Europe because of the functions I have in the 27 countries and I see, I see very difficult moments sometimes, but I see great hope in many of the young people that are now launching their ideas and how they are looking at the world. And from that point of view, I think you will see important developments. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Barroso. You also demonstrated not only is there a hopeful youth in the next generation in Europe, but also here in the United States. Uh, and you demonstrated your great ability to unify the capabilities of a political leader, a key administrator, and also an excellent teacher. And thank you for a great open uh, discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to uh, have to stop now. I, I apologize to the um, other questions, but I can tell you that uh, President Barroso is on Twitter, so you can interact <laughs> there with him. And with all this, uh, bon après-midi, and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming.